Regardless of the library you serve, there will be times when you'll need to address building-specific issues. For some, that may mean replacing or planning to replace carpeting or windows. For others, it may mean considering a renovation or addition. And for still others, it may mean planning for new construction. In each of these situations, certain factors must be considered. Your facility's current and future usage, your facility's environmental impact, and available resources to maintain a building that is both functional and appealing to patrons and potential patrons. To prevent the big oh no surprises that, that occur whenever in any facility, whether it be um, a home to a major institutional building, of course, preventative maintenance, having facility maintenance, uh, crew, you know, inspection of the, of the property and, and various aspects of the property. All those things are very, very important. And, and having some knowledge of the building itself. Um, care, watching, and planning. And keeping funds in reserve so that when there are, when there are situations that develop, that, that, there is, that there are the resources to deal with the issues. And, and it's ongoing. With buildings, it's, you know, there, there is always, always something that needs to be done, or always, always something that you wish to get done. <laughs> so planning, that's a, 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 a distinct need to plan for the building. A facility maintenance plan that includes at least a seasonal walk around the facility is essential. When everyday maintenance becomes a bigger issue, it may be time to talk about a remodeling, renovation, or new construction project. Several important elements should be considered to ensure that the building will serve your community's needs well into the next several decades. If a library is a system member, the Pennsylvania Code, Title 22, Section 141.24G, places responsibility on the system board to review and approve plans for construction, remodeling, or enlargement of units in the system to confirm that the units fulfill the needs of the areas served. There's hardly any aspect of a, a building that, that isn't important to the library. The facility, the grounds, the approach to the library, the signage exterior, the, the, all of the aspects inside and how easy it is for people to use, the lighting, of course, lighting is, is very important in libraries, but, but uh, quiet spaces, so, you know, the, the design so that, that there are enough quiet places for people to, to tuck in and hide, you know, and just be able to, to relax, read, explore, learn, um, easy checkout, easy computer access for the catalog, um, children's libraries. I mean, there are many different aspects. We serve many different parts of the community. So we have to look at the, who we're serving and, and how to work the spaces in. Uh, when in, in. During my tenure, we've really tried to keep the teens in mind because they, they kind of like to be segregated a little bit, have their own space that they can claim they, you know, be a little more relaxed, they're less formal. Um, also a quiet reading room so that those who are, <laughs> who want it to be a little more s serene have, have that space. Um, so, so there are, there are aspects, I mean, very basic storage aspects, the utilities, the bathrooms, all of these spaces have to, have to be considered. How is the building going to be used? A community room is very important for a community library because uh, um, my observation here is I think the usage of the library has been changing for the past 10 years. And I do see people come in just to borrow a book or borrow a movie or a DVD or you know a music CD. But I also think people like to come out to a program and that is why we really need a nice, comfortable community room, so where we can hold book discussion, we can have uh, um, lectures, and we could do um, lots of uh, children's programs. Uh, because that's where people get together, people react to each other, and uh, um, also I feel that's another important reason people like to come to the library. 
As Xu stated, it's important to know how your library is and will be used. To learn more about your library's current and projected usage, it's wise to consult your library director. If you are planning major changes, you'll need to fully understand the importance of the building's appeal and flexibility. If a board is taking on a large-scale project, uh, anything from renovation to a capital campaign for a new building, the director needs to be involved from the ground floor all the way up, figuratively speaking. The, uh, the director is going to be the person who is going to be running the operation on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the director has experience in library sciences and probably has forgotten more than the entire board knows about libraries. So having said that, uh, I think it would be negligent of a board not to include the director of the library in the process. Uh, the board, again, is ultimately responsible for the direction and, and the long-term planning, uh, the financial responsibilities, but not to take the advice and counsel of the person who's in the role that's going to be executing it when the project is done just makes no sense to me. Talk with your director about the daily operations of the library and any anticipated changes that may affect your plans for the future, such as technological or demographic changes. You will also want to survey people in your community for their input. Using that information, you can then envision a welcoming, community-centered facility that attracts people of all ages and interests. I think the people in it, I think the vitality, I think that sometimes when, uh, when library staff and library boards are planning a building, they start out by thinking, how much space will I need for the number of books I have? How many seats will I need for the number of people in my community? What kind of uh, square footage will I need? And they, they get fixated on blueprints, but I think what you really need to plan for is the number of people you want to attract to your facility. And so it should be light and bright and green and welcoming and warm, and it should be a place that people think they want to come to and stay they should act like they own it, because they do. So I think the more you can make it a people place, uh, the more you will be successful in a attracting. Becoming almost a third place in your community where people who go to work all day and go home all evening can find some place where they can go and just relax and feel comfortable, learn things, um, discover new magazines, watch people, uh, you know, look at the newest movies. Former library director Betsy Allen looked back on her experience in planning a new facility and shared some thoughts which you may want to keep in mind when planning changes to your library. A library building can be inviting in many ways. It could be the color of the library. It could be the fact that there's a lot of light and, and windows so that you can look in and see things going on. Um, there has to be interesting things in the library, not just books and materials, but comfortable places to sit and things to do. You know that your board, director, staff, collections, and policies should be chosen to suit the community they serve. The same philosophy holds true for the building itself. Um, I think structures should also be a part of the community. So every library, probably in terms of how it's built and how it looks and its design, should be different. Because it should be, I think architecturally, it should speak to that community. Um, and, you know, when you drive by it, it shouldn't look like something that's outside of that community, and I think it should also be warm and welcoming. To make it warm and welcoming as well as multifunctional, your plan should include a large community room. The space will provide vitality to the bricks and mortar by serving as a place for life-enriching programs and activities. It's very important to have a large community room. I would say one that could be divided in two would be good because there are many activities community activities that could take place in the library. It's important to think beyond the story time and to think about community events that could take place in the library. All of these factors can be confusing for someone who may not have experience with planning public spaces. Many trustees have relied on the expertise of consultants who specialize in library buildings. By using the resources available to them, the trustees were able to create a space with the flexibility to adapt to changing needs and save money in the process. If a community is changing, it's very important for the library board and the director 
to understand those changes. When you build a building, you're building a building for 50 years, so you need to have one that's flexible and also looks forward, not backward. It's imperative that we do the research, find the resources, and utilize consultants as available. Of course, we have to be judicious in, in, in how we spend our money with consultants, but if, if the right consultants are there, they, they save an incredible amount of money and make the projects smarter, better designed, uh, and, and help the libraries achieve, help the library achieve the goals that, of, that they are trying to, to implement. So definitely researching the, the, the resources that are available is an important thing to do. As both a library trustee and someone who has followed a green lifestyle for decades, Barry Kaplan recommends working with consultants to make public libraries more efficient and eco-friendly, setting an example for others in the community. We can be leaders in how to manage our buildings in environmental ways. Um, what, how, how, is the, what, how is the water runoff from the roof taken care of? How is the parking lot taken care of? The, the, in the, the chemicals that are used around the building, the chemicals that are used, the cleaning agents that are used in the building, the, the lighting, um, which we, the, it, to, to make the lighting more energy efficient, the heating systems, all of these things, we, we can lead the way showing people how to do it and actually help help people know that they can do it in, on a smaller scale or on a larger scale, that communities can do this. So, so whether it be um, carpeting made from recycled materials or um, the, the furnishings, the, the carols or the chairs to be from sustainable lumber, uh, whether it's you know, the lighting bills reduced, which all of this translates into investment but savings long term, as well as being good citizens and leaders. Kaplan also recommends that fellow trustees consider both short and long term savings when making decisions related to building maintenance, renovation, and construction. When considering costs of recycled materials, it's important to consider whole life cycles of materials, including disposal, impact. So there's actually a, a, a scale where in the greener options life cycle usually tends to be less expensive. Uh, so. Yes, cost, of course, is going to be a factor for, for all of us being responsible with budgets and with public money. Yet, the, if we factor in the longer view and, and see things as an investment, then usually the prices are competitive, as well as the fact that as the technology is made available more readily, prices are leveling. And, and it, it does not cost as much money to be green now as it did even a few years ago. As decisions are made regarding building projects or any expenditures, you must excuse yourself from voting when the question at hand may be related to your business or a personal connection. You want to avoid even the appearance of conflict of interest and may find that it is best to resign from the board in certain situations, such as when your company is bidding on a new construction project for the library. You would not want to put other trustees in the awkward position of voting for or against your company, and no matter how equitable the process may seem to be, the library's image in the community could suffer otherwise. This practice is consistent with your signed board agreement, which includes a conflict of interest statement. When your board determines that large-scale projects are necessary, a capital campaign may be required for the project to be financially feasible. Betsy recommends you take a close look at your community's ability to support the project before giving it the green light. Capital campaigns are uh, very difficult, but can be so rewarding when they are successful. It's important for library boards that want to get involved in a capital campaign to understand all the steps that are involved. 
And one of the first steps is a really good assessment of the project, the community, and the community's ability to give to that project. And sometimes the answer is that the library is not ready for a project. It's also important to plan for any increased costs associated with new space. A new building means doubled or tripled activity. That means a board must prepare for increased staffing and other operating expenses. Janice Trapp sees opportunity in continuing a capital campaign, so your board will have the resources it needs to maintain your facility. My advice would be not to let uh, several of the steps involved in a capital campaign ever end. I think a capital campaign doesn't end when you cut the ribbon and the building is opened. With careful planning, your board will be able to provide a welcoming, practical, and enjoyable facility for everyone in your community to use. Thank you for building libraries around on Earth. Thank you for, for whoever built the library.